All right. Welcome one and all to the PPC Unfiltered Podcast, where you get unfiltered insights and practical tips you can utilize from two people that actually do this stuff, that actually manage accounts, work with clients, etc. Michael Nadalin is my co-host somewhere in the screen. Michael, how are you, sir? Mate, I'm good. We haven't done this for two weeks because I've been on holiday, but I'm back and I'm refreshed. How are you going, mate? Very good. Same. I, I took kind of like a semi week off. It's hard as a business owner to take a full, you know, full week off. Obviously, I was still checking in my accounts. I got a million automations my clients know all about to check on any anomalies, but it's been good. I feel refreshed as well. So excited nice, going into November here. Awesome. Yeah. Well, let's start this amazing podcast today. We're in November, coming to the end of the year, good old Black Friday, Cyber Monday, all that chaos as well. So we can actually start this podcast today. Talking about that type of stuff. All right, but let's first, start with chaos. Go ahead. Oh, do you want to, we'll talk about the thing I was talking about earlier? Yes, or do you want to please. talk about that? Okay, cool. Yes. Okay, friends and family and compadres and enemies. I don't have many enemies, but I'm sure there'll be one watching in some day. So <laughs> over the last few months, we've at Market Lead had massive success in the agency. And it's come from two things. Number one, dropping lower quality clients, uh, and then number two, onboarding higher quality clients. Now, it sounds very like, oh, everyone could do that and everyone should do that, but it's the actual act of doing it. So there's two sides to it. Number one, if you're working with like lower quality clients, being it like it's really hard to get results for them, they're constantly emailing you. It's like, it's just kind of like chaos. That's going to constantly bring the energy and the attitude of your agency down. It will also bring the self-esteem of the specialist, you and everyone down. And it will kind of make you think that the industry is like really hard. Most businesses are horrible. Business owners are bad, blah, blah, blah. The easiest way is just to take that out of your reality bubble and just get rid of those clients. Now, a lot of people who'd be watching these podcasts are probably at the beginner or intermediate stage because most advanced people are just like raking in cash and just doing the work. And I know that myself because I don't watch any Google ads or advertising podcasts or content anymore because we're just doing ads, getting results and making money. But the thing I've noticed really recently was it's really important to work with clients and in clients who are either big companies who are making a lot of money or their average product or service value is really high. There's a high ticket value. The reason why is because if they start working with you and they haven't done much advertising in the past, you just doing a good enough job will get outsized returns because if they're selling something for ten, fifty, hundred thousand dollars, if you just get a few leads for them, that is a massive ROI for them immediately. Versus if you're working with a client who sells something for like a hundred or three or four hundred dollars, no matter the results you get, you're always going to be like, no matter how amazing you are at that you're still going to be playing a losing game because of the economics in the business. We've found recently that just by deciding to work with companies that have a high ticket product or service, it is so much easier to get results because there's actually less competition in the market. There's more competition for people selling services for $100 to $500 than people selling services from $10,000 to $100,000. So there's less competition. Number two, most of the time, these businesses haven't done marketing in the past, so it's easy to get amazing results because a lot of them have you know, a bit of history to their business. They're not just like a new business that's popped up. Number three, the ROI is almost immediate because a lot of products that are about $10,000 plus are legitimate products that people do need. It could be like machinery. It could be like infrastructure. It could be housing, things that people need that it's a real investment. And number four is a lot of these companies, they are so used to just traditional ways of business and marketing that by just running some ads and getting these results, you blow their mind. Their expectations were never high, but you've blown like it's, we've onboarded multiple clients recently who are high ticket that we've just been able to kill it for immediately. And it just feels like I'm in God mode in business. And the reason I say this is just because it's like those businesses are out there. They're everywhere. If the challenge is if you're always surrounding yourself with these lower quality businesses who kind of come to you, they're in real dire straits and they're kind of not good. 
you're just going to think that's the market. You don't think you're good enough. And then there's kind of like this downward reality bubble spiral. What are your thoughts, Corey? How do you guys deal and contend with the problem of low conversion volume, right? In this day and age where everything is driven by automation and AI and, you know, those things are very data hungry, right? They need a lot of data to do very well yep. in most cases. How do you guys contend with that in these, these types of high ticket, usually low conversion volume accounts? Oh, it's interesting. I don't think they're low conversion. I just think it, the low conversion comes from the strategy. So there's always ways to get a high volume of clients. So for example, and I'll tell you the solution, but I'll give you the example first. We just onboarded a client that I took 10 months to get. Now they came as a lead from one of my YouTube videos and I just thought they were like a fire client. And it took 10 months of me just kind of going back and forth to get them on. Now, 90 days, 90 days before they started working with us, they had only had 50 leads from Google ads, 50 leads from Google ads for about $400 a lead, 1%, less than 1% conversion rate. And most of them were spam. So those are the numbers in the 90 days beforehand within the first month, because they, their first month ended on the 4th of November, uh, they had 200 leads. So four times the leads cost per lead went from $400 down to $25 and the conversion rate went from 1% to over 20%. So same product, same business, different person running the ads. Now, the way we did that was just like, they were just running Google ads to their website. And it's like, cool. But what we did is like what I call like the, the like the holy trinity of advertising or like the magical quadrant, which is the holy trinity is Google ads, meta ads, and a landing page. And then the quadrant part would be the same, but with like a lot of data analysis to it. So I, we do a lot mm-hmm. of data analysis because when you, so what we did, and in this case, it's they weren't running meta ads. They're getting a high volume of qualified B2B, like really high qualified, like it's crazy because we use qualification questions and a landing page. So then the conversion rate goes up from like 1% to 20%. And then with all the data analysis as well, feeding that data back into the ad account, that's how you do it. Like Mm -hmm. it's just not a Google ads thing anymore. I think it's really dangerous for a lot of people just to think that Google ads is like the magical bullet or the Messiah solution. It's you've got to be thinking bigger now. And every of these clients that we do that, like these clients that we're killing it for, it's not Google ads anymore. It's Google, like it's in that matrix that I just mentioned then. Yeah. It's, it's a, it's a bundled approach to marketing, right? You're not yeah. just coming at it. Now, some, some advertisers, um, have issues, uh, problems being able to profitably advertise on multiple channels. Yeah. That's understandable. In some cases, Google ads is really the only thing they can profitably yeah. work in and they've tried it and it just is what it is. So there's going to be some exceptions, but uh, yeah, I can't agree more. You've got to, you've got to come at this. A consumer is going to bounce around to different places. You don't want to yeah. lose them in that interaction to competition or just their own behaviors. I agree with you, mate. I, I would also challenge you in the most positive way to uh, acknowledge your and my skill, which is no. when clients say like, oh, or they might go, Google ads is the only profitable channel. That may be because they've got someone like you or me running it. See, right. we've worked on meta accounts that, look, I don't position myself or my agency as a meta agency, but we, people come to us for Google ads and we give them the full suite of what they need. Cause they come for Google ads that we give them lead generation or sales. But look, I've done meta ads for five years. I did it at my last agency. I don't put content out there. I don't claim to be an expert. Like I see all these psychopaths online saying like, do this stuff with meta. And then I just do like a very, very like laser pointed approach with lead generation for Facebook or meta and get amazing results. And we've taken over accounts from people who are expert agencies. And I just realized it's not that the channels don't work. It's the people who are working the channels are not good. It's like, it's mm-hmm. actually this like that simple. Yeah, so, sometimes, right? I, I'll disagree a little bit on that because I mean, some of the times you could be awesome and it just doesn't work. The, there's there's no market fit. Uh, the audience just isn't there. You know, uh, yeah. see the competition's just too steep for your margins, whatever. There, there's, there's gonna be times where even though you're a badass, and this is for those people that have like, yeah, man, we try Facebook and we've tried everything. We're, we're you know, data scientists, we've done it. 
and they just yeah. can't get it to work. So it might not be on you necessarily in your skill set. Sometimes it, no matter what you do, that product or that service just just isn't working with that channel. And that's okay. Mm. TikTok's a great example, though there is rising uh, ad revenue there. You know, more people are trying and more brands are willing to try TikTok and invest there. Doesn't necessarily mean it's going to work for you and your demographic. Yeah, whatever. definitely. So, yeah, take what I means. was mainly talking about the Facebook side when people come to us saying Facebook doesn't work. Or Google, there's been so many times people come to us and they've got good businesses, like really good businesses. And for some reason, they're still, they're hesitant about Google ads, but they still wanted to do it. And then I'm like, oh, fuck, you've worked with all these agencies. Well, like, I feel like they're looking for that next like 1%. And then we just like restructure it. And then everything's like set and forget, like don't touch it again for years. And it's just like raking cash. Like mm. sometimes, Corey, I, I just think it's when you've been doing something for so long, it becomes normalized like breathing and then you forget that it's not normal for other people to operate at this level or think at this level or have strategy at this level and it's like yeah it's just it's an i just find it's an interesting thing that when you've done something for so long and you're so good at it sometimes you lower your thinking of how good you are but then you kind of take on a new account again like you take a new account you do one or two changes everything blows up immediately and you're like oh yeah. I have the Midas touch. <laughs> well, I will say, luckily, I do enough consulting <laughs> to be able to see other people's work. And I'm I just like, you know, I'm not trying to, you know, S-H-I-T on this person's work. Yeah. But, you know, have they given you reasoning as to this strategy or this structure or what, what were they thinking here? And the client has no idea yeah. uh, or the reasoning just makes no sense because you and I have done this long enough to recognize uh, illogical thinking. And yeah. They haven't done the data analysis. The person managing the accounts just focused on the wrong things uh, or they're yeah. focused just elsewhere. So, uh, yeah, I agree. Um, I will say, too, you know, just to add to, uh, you know, to kind of wrap this up, you know, and finding the higher ticket clients out there that, uh, in terms of their, their, their product prices, their service pricing. You know, one of the nice things I find with those types of clients is they tend to know their audience and they tend to know their market better than others. Because yes. they knew getting into this, you know, this is going to be a smaller audience. You know, they're not selling water, right? They, they understand this is expensive. There's going to be a big chunk of, of demographics that might not even, like, you know, let's say it's 18 to 24 that might never want to afford this or whatever it is. And they understand going into it, it's a smaller marketplace, but they also might be aware that the competition's not so steep. Therefore, that's why they started the business in the first place. Mm. So I tend to find that you get this nice match where um, they're very well informed, or at least they think they are, as to what the marketplace looks like and what, who their audience is. Now, sometimes we need to shake that tree a little bit yeah. uh, because, you know, it's not always what they thought it was. And, you know, we can get a market research firm included in that in that process and say, who is really the core audience? Now that we have some data, uh, we can run some surveys, et cetera. But yeah, yeah that's also an, an extra added benefit to working with clients like that too. Yeah. Really. The only downside, and this is just the downside to it, is a lot of these businesses have traditionally been uh, got their clientele from referral and it's been a low volume base. So when you have like referral, it's naturally a higher probability of sale because it's been like, hey, someone's told you about this when you're looking for it, you're in that buying intent. And then number two, the volume is low, so you can actually manage the leads. One of the biggest issues that we see with these clients is if they don't have a sales team or a sales process, they get that high volume of leads and these people aren't like burning hot. They're like warm. They're interested. They're like literally proactively looking, but they're not like I'm starving here. So that buying intense lower. So they've got to figure out a way to push it high. And also that yep. volume's high. Like they've got to figure out how do they address 200 leads in a month when they're probably getting like 10 leads a month mm -hmm. and changing the systems. And that's a big gap for them where they start getting the high quality leads they say the quality is good. They're quoting them, but they just turn, can't turn them into sales because they don't have the sales process down. Yes, so, and if, yeah, if you're going to start working with clients like that, know that getting into it is particularly for lead gen, but even for e -com where there's a high touch uh, necessity for sales where someone's going to have to contact them. Like you're not selling that $10,000 product on the site, for example. They're still going to have to contact sales. So essentially it's, it's kind of lead gen, e -com, whatever. Yeah expect going into that if you want to work with those types of clients you're going to have to be good with uh kind of business 101 communication with the client uh, communication potentially with their sales team and checking in on that stuff because yeah. now your results 
are a lot more reliant than you might like on the sales team. If that sales team yeah. can't support it, Michael, you know this, already. we talk about this all the I time. Right. If they can't support it, you could be driving quality <laughs> stuff and they can't see it, uh, at least internally. So, yep. Yeah, I've got a call in, I think, an hour and a half about that. And it's like every call is just about their sales. They're like, oh, but the ads aren't working. I'm like, bro, like you, you're quoting these people and you're telling me they're good. This is not an ads issue. It's your sales process. But that's the thing. And this is where even as just an individual, you get a huge professional development because you start to realize you move into like that business consultant role and you make way more money by helping businesses with this stuff, consulting as well as doing the ads than just being the ad person. Like they can just get an ad person on Upwork. That's not where the value is anymore. It's the ads plus the like the insights and the recommendations and the next steps and then understanding how it fits in with the business. And I just don't think people still don't get that yet. That's why most people, when you watch Google ads videos or videos online, they're talking about the technical. The technical is like the first 40%. But if you even if you're at 100% of that 40%, you're still at 40%. The next 60% is business intelligence, insight, data analysis, knowing how it fits into the business, consulting with the business. That's where you actually make a lot of money. Hmm. Mic drop. Good. All right. I think we've we have covered this. Hopefully you guys enjoyed it. We've got a bunch of stuff to cover today, Michael. We've got Black yeah, no. Friday, Cyber Monday creeping up. We got some hot tips for you guys there. We got a ton of news because Google has just been making a lot of rampage. Changes. Some people are excited. Some people are yeah. a little hot and cold on what's happening. <clears throat> but uh, let's get right into it, Michael. You good with that? Awesome. Mate, right. let's do it. I've got to jump off in 28 minutes. So we've got to do this express, bro. All right, set your time. Let's go, Michael's mate. has got to go. All right, so first off, I wanted to cover just because, again, this is very top of mind for me every single day, weekends, whatever. Even though I took that week off, I'm still looking at this stuff because I'm a super nerd. I always want to know what's new, uh, what's happening, what, you know, what, what are the results of some of the tests we're running. So I wanted to help you guys out with some last-minute Black Friday, Cyber Monday strategy tips and some insights, some things that we're finding as well. So, Michael, first off, I wanted to mention... Uh, in terms of Black Friday, Cyber Monday, there's some interesting, I, I didn't actually go into October knowing this. It wasn't until uh, I saw some research on this that this is actually technically going to be a much shorter holiday shopping period than we've had in the past. So it's actually going to be five fewer days between Cyber Monday and Christmas. So the holiday shoppers, that sort of peak shopping period is going to be a little bit smaller than we're used to by a full mm. five days. It might not sound like much on the surface, but you go back in your data and you look at some of those daily numbers in November, that's a lot of money for a lot of businesses. What does that mean, right? So Michael, I'd love to hear your thoughts. I just want to say off the bat, it's probably going to mean earlier promotions, which we've been seeing for major retailers since the second week of October, yeah. the Walmarts of the world and stuff. They also know this stuff. They're recognizing it. So they're doing a lot of promotions. I know you're not big on like the whole, you know, cutting into your margins yeah, and stuff. Yeah, yeah, yeah. But, but curious, are you guys seeing that? What things are you guys trying to implement to take advantage? So firstly, I'd love a bit more context on that five fewer days. How yeah. how does that work? Thanksgiving is uh, falling later in November than in last year. So it okay. ends up being a smaller, yep, smaller gap. Okay in between the uh, Cyber Monday, Black Friday, and Christmas. So you get okay, five fewer days yeah, between that period. Yep. Interesting, interesting. So yep. let's loop back to the question. Okay. What are we, is this, the question is, what are we seeing or what are we doing? Oh, it's up to you, whatever you want to do with it, man. It's it's uh, it's, it's it's your your mic. If you yeah, want to talk so, about things you guys are seeing or things you guys are you know, implementing uh, this, this Cyber Mo Monday, Black Friday, let us know. Yeah, so the trend I've seen across our clients October, and the thing is that this is based on data, and then we go to the hypothetical, is year-on-year -year revenue's been up, but the ROAS has been either down a little bit, um, but the results are still strong, and then it looked like a drop for like multiple clients in the last week or two in October. But then now already November's already had a huge boom across heaps of clients in e-commerce. Now, in terms of promotions, all of our clients have been, even if they didn't want to do promotions, they've started to do kind of like indirect promotions. So I think it's kind of like there is a bit of that hype where you just like, even if you don't want to kind of discount and lose profit, you still got to kind of buy into the market sentiment a bit. So I've got a lot of clients who have been running promotions since October and that's fine. And they're going well. And it's just like, I think it's just to kind of keep 
people in the loop because it's kind of an expectation in the market that people are holding on to cash a little bit, waiting for those Black Friday sales. But also, I think everyone knows that Black Friday is not the Black Friday day. It's the Black Friday week, month, season, essentially. Mm -hmm. So I think people now are just like as soon as a promotion come up, they know that this is the Black Friday promotion. There's no like one Black Friday where you're going to get 70% off like some iPhone it's really just going to be like this season is like the week or the fortnight or the three weeks. That's the discount. I think the clients I'm working with, they're just doing that as well. There's no, then none of them are like on Black Friday, we're doing this one thing. It's like for the week before, the weeks before, that's it. Yeah. That's like it. Yeah. What about you, mate? I was going to say, I mean, definitely earlier promotions, definitely trying to get yeah. things going and to build an audience for November. I feel like we're getting more informed. Um, uh, brands, uh, brands that are understanding that, you know what, we got to kind of cut into profits a little bit uh, end of October, uh, especially when they work with me and I can give them sort of the breakdowns of seasonality based on past data. If we have good data for that, we can say, you know, we are expecting kind of a poop emoji last couple of weeks of October. Yeah, it just kind of is what it is. It's not going to be as great as we would love, yeah. but that's expected, right? That's the idea, yeah. right? We can say, guys, this is not going to be a surprise to us, but it's okay because we do want to use this time to experiment a little bit with building more of an audience, funding more of our advertisements to see what happens compared to past November's when we cut budgets around this time, right? So we're able to do that. I also want to say too, is we have seen an increase, and by we, I mean me and my brands that I work with, increased demand for expedited shipping. That has been interesting, but not yes. surprising when you think about it, right? Because yep. because because people understand, like, I, I don't have as much time in between uh, these days. Well, I, I've got to get this going. And I think there's yep. also just a, a sort of a, every year that this happens or people get all these things, they get more and more impatient with getting the gifts in time for Christmas because they've yep. gotten screwed in the past. So I, I'm also seeing that as well inside the data. Yep. Not a big surprise. I only buy from Amazon. But yeah. I just know if I get, I wanted that delivery the next day. And I think that's part of the, I think retailers and e-commerce businesses need to understand that Amazon are setting an expectation for fast delivery. So when you're saying expedited delivery, I think that that's just going to be a norm. Like people want what they want fast. They don't want that Timu 28 day. They want that. Like I get it in the next few days Yeah, type of thing. That's true. So I think that's, that's a, a really important point sense. you've said there because I think that would be a lot of uh, people have a stock levels and delivery times are going to be a huge factor beyond just price. Yep, absolutely. Now, I know the uh, the the port strike on the East Coast of the U.S. did affect some businesses in terms of getting inventory uh, ready mm. for November. A lot of that has been, you know, that got settled, of course, in terms of the strike. But I know it did create some delays for a couple of clients, uh, but we seem to be okay now. But I know for some clients that did cause some hiccups. Luckily, it wasn't closer to Black Friday's everybody or its inventory yeah. issues would be an issue. Um, I want to also hit our hit our uh, our watchers and listeners with uh, an interesting. Uh, study that was done by Deloitte. Um, so 40% of U.S. consumers plan to complete all seasonal shopping during the four-day sales period between Black Friday and Cyber Monday. 40% wow. of consumers in the U.S. plan to buy all of their, do all their seasonal shopping in that yeah. time. Now that's big, folks. That's like, in other words, if you don't usually run promotions, you've been considering it. This year, it sounds like it's going to be a big deal. Yeah. Um, yeah. So definitely a big one. Highly recommend. That's a lot of shopping that's going to happen in yeah. a very short period of time. So. And I think the good news for a lot of people is it's weeks before the holidays or Christmas. Depends on your religion. <laughs> but the reality is that I think people, if you just get it done in a few days, and then over the next few weeks, you're getting all your deliveries. You don't need to go out for shopping. You don't need to do anything. You don't need to be going through like shopping malls and other things. Actually, that makes sense because I was thinking about that yesterday. Like I just want to do like one bulk buy of like all the presents I do and then that's done. Yep. And why not do it when it's weeks out from Christmas or holidays? Let's be yeah. politically correct. <laughs> and um, weeks out from the holidays and also when things are on a better price. This is also just my own theory. I have no data to back this. So, you know, mute me if you want to. But I, I'm just curious because I think I think partly too, we've sort of become so accustomed to these deals that we understand the difference in promo for most products and services 
is not dramatically different at the end of October than it is in, for yeah. Black Friday, Cyber Monday. So we're just like, I'd just rather get it done now. I, maybe I'll save an yeah. extra 10% or 5%, but, you know, hey, these guys never do promotions. They're doing it now. It's the end of October. I want to be prepared. I don't want to be last minute, you know, shopper again, run into inventory issues or whatever. I'm just going to order it now. So I think yeah. that plays a part. Again, I don't have any data to, to support that, but I would think that it makes a little bit of common mm. sense. So. There would be people, like obviously we have our own confirmation bias in echo chambers. Like I agree with you, but I'm like, no, there's actually probably people who actually do wait out for it. Like oh, really do, like have products that have been holding like in a shopping basket or in like a spreadsheet. They're like, I'm waiting for Black Friday. Yeah. But like, I don't know about you, man, but I haven't seen anything going like epic sale on Black Friday. It's the same, like every client, every business I see, they mainly run the same specials throughout the year. They're just playing into it like, you know, going to a family event where they're like, yeah, I'm going here, but I'm pretending to be happy, but I don't really want to be here. No, I definitely do. I see, I see huge promotions, uh, really? courses, uh, like high oh. ticket item stuff. Yeah. Um, okay. Some advertisers, uh, some of my clients, we rarely do promos, you know, it's like, we only do them once or twice a year, let's say like Memorial wow. Day okay. and Black Friday. Sarah. So in that case, okay, we, big shot. Okay. We have okay. To, no, so you know, <laughs> it's just reality, right? Some, <laughs> yeah, I get you, some advertisers definitely, when they do rare promotion, I think you're right though. When they, when they do promotions throughout the year and that's very consistent, um, I don't expect a dramatically different yeah. promotion and their, their consumer base is already kind of used to doing promos. It's like if yeah. Udemy is doing another $10 sort of sale and they do it for $8 for Black Friday, Cyber Monday, everyone's gonna be like, yeah, okay, cool. I wasn't going to yeah. do that anyway, like, or I wasn't going to do that anyway. So anyway, we got a lot of news to cover and not nice, a lot man. of time. So shall we move to our news section? Let's do it, bro. All right. Guys, tons of notes here. I want to get into the big one. And I think, Michael, you, you've, you've probably heard of this already. It's the big one, I say, because it's probably the most controversial um, news that's come out. Uh, some people very excited about it. I think until they think more deeply about it, because on the surface, it looks great. It looks like more control, mm. whatever. What is this news that I'm teasing? It is that AdRank will now determine whether Pmax or standard shopping for the same product, if advertised, will show up. Let me make that a little more clear for people. If you have product A and product A is both in a performance max campaign as well as in a standard shopping campaign, so we're just talking shopping ad network here, and you have that same product in both campaigns, now instead of Pmax just always taking the highest priority and that product will predominantly show in the Pmax campaign, now they will fight and essentially, ad rank will determine which uh, campaign will get the ad impression. Michael, initial thoughts? Have you heard about this? This is a very hot topic right now in the community. I have lightly heard about it, and I'm just quickly looking at a few notes about it because I'm eager to know more about it. I'm just curious about how the ad rank is decided. Bid, decided. <laughs> at this point, just bids. <laughs> yeah, okay. <laughs> essentially essentially bidding. If Yeah, if it's, it's to save you the rabbit holes, that's yeah. because we're just talking shopping ad network here. You know, the difference between a PMAX shopping ad and a standard shopping shopping ad, what's the difference, right? Essentially, at this point, if, if they're going to show in both and we're talking about ad rank, well, everything that it determines ad rank is going to be the same between the two ads. The difference yeah. is how much are you willing to bid? This is where the debate comes in. Are costs going to rise depending on your structure, depending on exclusions, et cetera? Yeah. But essentially, which one's willing to bid more? Of course, classic Google move <laughs> to say yeah. who's going to pay us more money and we'll show the ad there. Well, this is, I'm just writing some things now. This change pushes advertisers into a position where higher bids and by extensions, higher costs become necessary to ma maintain visibility. So that's the thing, like Pmax is auto deciding their cost per click whilst manual shopping would be. If you're doing manual. That's a big deterrent, right? Yeah. So it's it's going to depend yeah. on like which we do have a lot, lot, uh, lower target return ad spend and your Pmax for that yeah. that product uh, versus uh, standard shopping, or whatever. It's going to be part of what we have to see. Now, guys, I don't think it's going to affect as many accounts as we're thinking. Uh, I think this will largely be for people who set up like a generic catch-all uh, standard yeah. shopping campaign for their branded search and they excluded brand from Pmax. And then all of a sudden you're going to have 
all these branded terms showing up in both and it removes the control you were hoping for. I don't think this will have such an impact on those more advanced uh, or more experienced advertisers that are still doing query structured and query sculpted standard shopping. You got prior, uh, standard shopping priorities at the campaign and setting level um, that are you know, along with negative keywords to essentially uh, funnel certain types of intent or whatever it is, you know, high performers into certain high bid campaigns, et cetera, et cetera. It's a whole rabbit hole. I'm going to save you guys the technical details, look more into that if you're curious. But essentially, I think that's where most of the effect is going to happen is those kind of people who created the catch-all generic brand standard shopping campaign. They didn't do query sculpting. They didn't use priorities. And now all of a sudden, you're going to see a lot more overlap. I don't know that this is going to be such a horrible impact for people who are utilizing query sculpted standard shopping campaigns yeah. or for those most campaigns, most accounts that just use one or the other. They're either just all on board with standard shopping for those products, or it's all in for just Pmax, and it's one or the other. They don't have the same product showing in both. Yeah, this is really interesting. Thanks for sharing that. And even just looking at some of these things, it's just like more chaos needed. <laughs> of course. Like more chaos in Google Ads. It's like, what's the ultimate benefit? I don't know. Google makes well, more money. <laughs> yeah, well, the benefit to them, and it's like it just seems like the only thing around here is people just saying, What's your CBCs? What's your ROAS? You know, ad rank, all this type of stuff. It's just, mm -hmm. yeah, it just seems, yeah, it's, I'm going to look it's, more into this, but it's just another one of those things where I'm like, oh, here we go. It's a here lot of chaos. Go. Yeah, it's a lot of chaos. And it, I think it's horrible timing. Like I get the whole AI asset stuff rolling out just in time for November. Okay, cool. Like yeah. for those advertisers that are really going to utilize those features, but this type of thing right before a major holiday event, a seasonal event, Ah oh, man, give us time to to test it and warm it up or whatever. Yeah, man, you know that's it's, it might screw a couple of accounts. So we'll see. Again, I don't think it's going to be the majority that are going to have to just freak out over this. Um, I know there are some people that are theorizing about some opportunities within this. Though again, I think those might be a little bit overblown, and we'll see. Right, we're going to test things out. We're going to figure out the hacks or whatever, and see if there are any hacks that are even available here. Yeah. But um, yeah. It is Do you think Google ways. Ads with all these changes over the last few years is still getting easier and you're getting better results? Or do you think it's getting harder? Uh, I think it's just my kind of non-answer is that it just necessitates uh, your unique um, business acumen and your unique you're essentially configuring your job is now to communicate the insights you figured out for your business inside your data, whatever to Google and you figure out the feature settings, et cetera, to do yeah. so, uh, to meet those objectives. So I'd say it's more difficult in that way. It's less about yeah. knowing these hacks and like, where do I find search terms? It's that's just become more obvious. Well, then they did the interface change. It was a little less obvious, <laughs> but regardless, yeah. uh, I'm a little mixed on that, but I'd say it's become harder for harder to compete and stay competitive for um agencies Lower. that are used to working with less informed clients and brands yeah. that they didn't really weren't really adding much value and now that's become obvious because there isn't much in the change history not that you should be monitoring yeah. changes or that that says everything about the value your agency is delivering but anyway that's long-winded kind of my yeah my thoughts. Huh? No, interesting. I just think like, I've just noticed the only clients that are winning now are the ones who are actually taking responsibility for their business 100% and not just going, oh, this ad person will just like fix my half-assed business. Mm. Like businesses that just weren't like, that just do not want to take responsibility and just think that ads will fix the problem. No matter what, ads will not fix the problem. The actual ads will only like enhance what's happening in the business. Sometimes, yeah. Yeah, most of the time. Yeah. Yeah. Can't fix a broken business with Google ads, ladies yeah. and gentlemen. It's you used to be way. able to, honestly. You could, you, <laughs> back in the day, you could just get like heaps of leads and they just get some rubbish sales and they're like, you know, they just make money. But now it's just like, it's very unforgiving. It's extremely unforgiving. It's a good way to put it. Yeah. Yeah. Always, you always need that conversion rate optimization. You always need a good website. Uh, yeah. Actually, speaking of which, that brings me to one of my next uh, news updates. Michael, this is definitely more relevant for you guys in the lead gen side because I mostly work on larger e-com accounts. But <clears throat> Google My Business profile is now a requirement to run local service ads. So if you have an account that wants to or is running local service ads, you have got to verify 
your Google My Business page profile ASAP. Now there is not like an ETA that I've, at least that I saw uh, in my research on this, um, you know, but I would just recommend getting on top of that as soon as possible. So if you want to run local service ads in the future, you've got to verify your Google My Business profile. Very, very interesting. Important. Don't miss that, guys. Um, I think by November down. 21, they say. Yeah. Yeah. Interesting. That's a big one. Also, similarly, uh, call ads are sunsetting for RSAs, responsive search ads. No more call ads. Now, I know most people will say, who the hell is running call only ads anymore? But I will be frank. I actually created a whole HVAC, HVAC way back in the day system whereby because a lot of uh, heating, ventilation, air conditioning, uh, local service uh, clients, they had just trash websites and they yeah. knew it and they weren't going to work <laughs> on it anytime soon. So I was like, you know what? Let's just utilize this feature where we don't even have to send people to the website. Let's just get, you know, for emergency yeah. services, you know, a boiler emergency, whatever. Uh, let's just run call only ads. We don't need, we can do yeah. Google ads. We can take advantage of the best that Google has, which is to be right there when someone's looking for a service and not send them to a piece of trash website and we can still get you tons of leads and it was amazing and it still works thing is now it's going to push them to rsas which will require a landing page really? and that might be hurting some people yep i, I, I feel like i've been out of the the loop of um news for like this yeah sunset call ads migrating yeah. responses search ads whoa that's huge it's a big one for some not everybody you know that's kind i know of i've been using them probably in like yeah. eight years <laughs> Yeah, yeah, yeah. <laughs> That's the thing. It's a little bit like probably wider sunsetting. Yeah, they're like, yeah, yeah, this is 10% of advertisers. Uh, okay. Uh, okay. This one's more interesting, I think, guys. So um, so Google, uh, Google, not uh, Microsoft as well, a little bit here, but ads and AI generated search summaries. So you go to Google, you type in, uh, hey, I got a stain on my yep. pants. Uh, how do I get the stain out? Whatever. Uh, how you get that stain? We're not going to get that, Michael. I can already <laughs> see you <laughs> sweating. Uh, but uh, ads and AI generated search summaries. This will just be in the US market on mobile, only mobile US market here. So don't freak out if you don't see it. Yeah. But uh, we are going to see more ads in those AI generated search summaries. So it's going to have uh, people thinking about how do we make sure that we can optimize our stuff for that. I don't have a bunch of insights on you. This is all very new, but it is something that's coming. Uh, as well on Microsoft Copilot, we're going to be also seeing those uh, ads in search summaries. So just essentially more ads in the AI generated search summary responses from both Google and Microsoft. So this will be interesting to see how that changes things over time. Of course, uh, co uh, not Copilot, uh, ChatGPT, same thing. Probably going to be seeing more ads from the free version. Mm. All right. So with that, so I think far? it's really important yeah. people just like stay on top of your search term reports, yes. clean them up mm -hmm. and clean them up before the fact, because you don't want to get to the point where Google starts even hiding more and more searches and you can't pick up on those phrases or those terms that are actually like juicing your butt, like taking so much of your budget out. I think more yes. than ever search term negatives, whilst there's, they're less transparent or being shown, get on them every day prune that tree, prune that bonsai, add them to your list. So then even in the future, when all these AI, you know, responses, short answers are coming out and they're showing ads to it, you're just not being shown next to just like weirdo questions. Mm -hmm. That stuff will start happening more and more. And also yeah. I don't think they'll start showing the search terms reports for it. Mm -hmm. Yeah. And that's the thing because we don't want to let Google decide fully uh, for long periods of time, what, what is defined as commercial intent. Because yes. you as an advertiser are going to have a certain amount of money that you can put towards this and a certain threshold where you're like, ah, we can't keep spending on this. This yes. is too generic. They Google might see this as, well, the guy's got a stain on his pants and he's trying to figure out how to get it off. We should sell him this Tide pen or whatever. It's like, well, but... <laughs> we should sell him new pants now. <laughs> yeah, just new pants. And I can see Google doing that, right? Yeah. Like, yeah, it's so, you know, be monitoring that. Take the control back as much as you can. Don't just let Google run crazy with figuring out its own intent. Sometimes you just got to rein it in a little bit. Not yes. always, but some, in most cases. Um, all right. So uh, Google, oh, where are we at with time here? So Google ads uh, revenue uh, still doing really good. Served for quarter, uh, for quarter, surge for quarter three. Now, I will say just from a data analysis standpoint, that is mostly going to be due to the election ads, uh, especially in the U.S. Yeah. So, yeah, take it with a grain of salt, but 
ads revenue has been increasing a lot for Google on Q3, at least that's reported. Um, so, you know, take it for what it is. I think it's mostly election based, but again, it is also a testament to the effectiveness of Google ads as a marketing channel. Mm. May consider utilizing that again, if you're continuing to wait on pulling the trigger in 2024 on Google ads, it still shocks me that people are like, yeah, we've been thinking about it for 10 years. Just never really pulled like guys, what I mean, people are looking for what you're offering and yes. you're not there. That is crazy to me, but I understand. Yeah. Limited budget, limited resources. It's a little confusing. Okay. understand. So interesting nonetheless. Uh, let's see. Oh, okay, Michael, I thought this one would be really interesting to bring up. So Google Lens, uh, ladies and gentlemen, so for you Apple users, I'll explain what this is. No, I'm here, <laughs> here, kidding. Uh, Google Lens, in, in a lot of cases, you're going to like take a photo or a video of something. Uh, that now has, Google Lens, 20 billion visual searches per month. 20 billion visual searches per month. So in wow. other words, someone scans like, what is this this bug or like, what are these fish in the aquarium? You know, why do they swim together? Whatever. Um, we're getting 20 billion of these visual searches a month, guys. So Google is taking advantage of this. It is now considered to be the fastest growing query type on search. Not a big surprise there, uh, especially in the 18 to 24 demographic. Again, not surprising. So if that fits your marketplace and that that's your demographic, consider how your products are being featured in terms of imagery, in terms of video. Mm. If you have retail store placements, are we are we setting those up for success and optimizing those for these types of experience, these types of searches? These are things you might want to be considering. Those are for, kind of the larger advertisers. But interesting, nonetheless, 20 billion yeah. visual searches a month. That blows my mind. Dude, that's crazy. I didn't even know to say that. That is wild. Yeah, it's a big one. So we're going to be seeing more ads there. That's essentially Google's new thing is they're saying we're going to be enhancing. They've had ads for this for a few years, but they're going to be now including and enhancing those in terms of shopping ads. They're going to be richer, richer results than ever. So more reviews, price comparison, uh, where can you buy it locally, et cetera, where can you buy it online? So this is going to be something we have to be factoring into uh, our analyses here. You know, how are we doing in those regards. Um, we're also starting to see that both image and video via Google Lens is going to be included. So someone can actually be taking a video of something and be essentially talking to their phone at the same time. So like, you know, how does this work? Or, you know, where can I get one of these? And boom, you're going to see some shopping ads there. Yeah. And you might want to be optimized for that. Wow. That's the whole point. Yep. Awesome. It's going to be interesting. Well, my... How did that, how does that affect product feed optimizations and stuff like that, right? It, for certain products, like, it's just going to be interesting to see how that changes search terms and how much more work that's going to uh, yeah. add to search term monitoring, things like that. No. Yeah, it may just come down to you just need better product images so they can loop in like their AI to loop in whatever you're showing to your product. Yeah. Like, I think it's just going to come down to the quality of the images rather than the quality of the text or the... Because we've been so text focused over the last, you know, since right. it's begun with keywords, but now it's going to be more visual focused because... Yeah. That's what this AI or um, AR augmented reality would be able to start like picking up is like, you're filming this, you're taking a photo of this. What's the closest image to that? Mm -hmm. so, yeah. It's fascinating. It's it's the future for sure. Yeah. Mean, clearly 20 billion searches a month. Uh, all right. Last couple well, of minutes, guys, we're going to wrap this up. I'm just going to, I've got, I've got to jump off in one minute. So should we wrap one, this okay, up? We now? got one I've minute, got to, one minute. All right. We'll save this other news for next time. Most of these have been out for a week or so, so that's okay. But those are some of the biggest highlights. Uh, hopefully that's helpful for you guys. I know there's a million different news outlets for this stuff. And you're like, hey, where do I get my information from? We're going to have our own takes on some of this in the following episodes. Michael's got to hop. But Michael, before we go, where can people find you? People can find me at Michael Nadalin or Market Lead, Market Lead, sorry, Michael Nadalin on LinkedIn, <laughs> marketlead.com.au, Market Lead on YouTube and the PPC Unfiltered Podcast. What about awesome. you, mate? Corey Lindholm, LinkedIn mostly, a little bit of Twitter. Uh, I'm on YouTube as well. I haven't posted in a while. Sorry about that, guys. You know, things yeah. have been busy. Things have been crazy. It's a lot of work. I'm getting there. I'm getting back to you, mm. I promise. Um, as well as the uh, PPC Unfiltered podcast on both YouTube and Spotify. Thank you to all of our listeners and viewers. We will see you guys in the next episode. Nice. See you guys.